Over 327 million people visited national parks in 2019. And it's estimated that 1,600 people go missing every year from public lands. That's national forests and national parks. It's also believed that many of these missing people get lost or disoriented. This is why being able to find your cardinal directions anywhere you are, north, south, east, and west, is essential for anyone who wants to explore the wilderness. But what if you have no signal? or your phone is dead, or you don't have a compass. Can you rely on things like moss to tell you where north is? What if I told you the trees themselves can point you north? Come on, I'll show you. This is why you need to do the things you need to do to need to do them. <laughs> What's good everyone, it's Johnny Lim, the backpacking biologist, the hot chocolate Asian, your Sherpa to the natural world. And we've all heard moss grows on the north side of trees. And today we're going to be figuring out, is there any truth to that statement? And are there any better ways of using our natural surroundings to find north? Now we have a Mediterranean climate down here in Southern California, which is characterized by hot, dry summers and cool, mild winters. I mean, it's January right now, we're in the middle of winter and it's 67 degrees. And that's gonna make finding moss pretty difficult. I mean, moss likes cool, damp areas. So how about let's go somewhere where it's gonna be easier. I'm here at the Ho Rainforest in Washington. You'll find this in Olympic National Park. This place is covered head to toe in moss and lichen. Now, if you see the trees, the moss is not really picking a side to grow on. It's growing on all sides. So why is that? But first we need to understand moss. Moss are plants, so they photosynthesize for food. The only difference between them and normal plants is that they don't have a vascular system. You know, we have a vascular system. It's called our blood vessels. They transport blood from different tissues, right? So plants have the same thing. Well, not for blood, but they need to transport water and food. Moss don't have a vascular system and rely on osmosis to transport water directly from the air or by direct contact. Water goes in and feeds individual cells, which is why mosses can't be tall. They physically wouldn't be able to transport water. This is why they have to grow on trees or grow on the floor, and there has to be an abundance of water available, either in the air or just raining or on the ground. So what would make moss want to grow on the north side of trees anyways? The answer has to do with the curvature of the Earth. So this is the Earth. Well, really it's a globe, but one thing you need to take notice is it's not flat, right? It's a sphere. And depending where you live on this sphere, sunlight will hit you differently. Now, I live in the Northern Hemisphere along with 90% of the world's population. But if you live on the equator, the sunlight will be hitting you more or less directly overhead. Now, the more north you go, the more angled you are away from the sun. And that's just because of the curvature of the Earth. Now, this light represents the sun, and this earplug represents a tree. And I'm going to plant this tree right in the middle of North America. Now, notice where the shadow is pointing. It's pointing north. Now, what happens when I rotate the Earth a bit? What you'll notice is the shadow will move, but the north side of the tree will always stay in the shade. So any object in the Northern Hemisphere will naturally cast a shadow north. More shade means less evaporation. Less evaporation means more water, which means the north side of trees is also the wettest, which is why moss prefers the north over any other side. But what if you live in the Southern Hemisphere? Well, it would be the opposite, and the shadow will be casting south instead of north. So if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, everything I say from here on out should be the opposite if you want to apply it to you. So now I'm here in Felton, California, and I'm surrounded by Douglas firs. And on those Douglas firs are a ton of moss. So I'm thinking this is the best place to test out if the moss is pointing north. Now, as I'm looking around this forest, I can see that there's moss on all sides. So it's gonna be kind of hard and kind of tough to figure out if moss is really pointing in one direction. Let's try to find some moss that seems to be directional. All right, I think we found some right here. If you look, you can definitely see there's moss on this side. But as far as this side, oh my God, I'm, I'm a white person now. <laughs> moss is pointing that way. 
our instincts would be telling us that that way is north. Same thing goes with this tree right here. You can see the moss pointing that away. But if we look at our compass, north is actually that way. So the tree is wrong. Now we can get lost in this forest just looking for trees that might be pointing north. What about this hairy boy? I mean, it's looking kind of good, right? It's pointing that way, that way. Look at our compass. That's probably the closest north we can find. My point is, is that moss is not just gonna tell you where north is. We learn that moss grows on the wettest side of the tree or rock or whatever it's growing on, right? It grows on the wettest. And the problem is, is that in a forest, you can have many different sides that are wet. You know, the sun is on this side and this tree is blocking this way, so it's creating shade on this tree, which makes the moss grow over there, right? Which is why you can find moss growing on every side of a tree. And it doesn't always point north. So you don't want to rely on it. I mean, out of this whole forest, I only found one tree where the moss is actually pointing north. There's a lot more reliable sources they can use to find north if you're lost and moss should not be one of them. Now, a more reliable technique is to use the trees themselves. We can actually apply the same principle to trees as we did to moss, but in a larger scale. In the Northern Hemisphere, the north face of mountains gets the least amount of sunlight, which means more water will favor the north side. The south-facing slope gets pelted by direct sunlight, melting snow and evaporating water. The north face is notorious for being the most formidable side for mountaineers. That's because it's the coldest side, it's the shadiest, and has the most ice. And that's why the brand North Face is called North Face, and why most ski resorts are facing north. Trees will naturally grow where water is more present. And if you pay attention, you'll start to notice patterns in their distribution. If you see a bunch of trees and vegetation growing on a single side of a hill or mountain, that side will most likely be north, especially if this trend spans over a wide area. Now look at this mountain, for instance. There's a clear side in which the trees are favoring. And it's this side. And guess which side is north? Now, I do prefer this method for finding north over moss or lichen, and that's because it works in a larger scale, and there are fewer variables. A good rule of thumb is that the larger the scale of the observation, the more accurate it will be. But, like many things in life, this method isn't perfect. Trees can bundle up on south-facing slopes if there are corners in the hillside where water will funnel. If the north side of a mountain is too steep, trees won't take root. Larger mountains can cast shadows on smaller hills, causing trees to grow on any side. And lastly, the shape of a mountain can affect where trees grow. If the mountain is long and angled slightly from north, trees can grow on whatever slope is less south-facing, which can either be northeast or northwest. But the biggest drawback to using this method is it won't work if your region gets a lot of water. That's because trees will grow everywhere on every side. It doesn't even matter what direction. So it's better than using moss or lichen for sure. And I use this method the most just to get a general idea of where north is. But there's a better, more tried and true way to find north. And that is using the shadow stick. So this method is called a shadow stick or shade stick. And what you need is just a stick, somewhat thick. The thicker the stick, the better. It's gonna cast a better shadow. And it doesn't have to be too long, maybe like two feet. Uh, it doesn't have to be longer than that. But what you're gonna wanna do is get a stick and then shove it directly into the ground at a 90 degree angle. And what you're gonna see here is it's gonna cast a shadow, right? And we're gonna mark the end with these rocks where the shadow starts. And as the sun starts to move, across the sky, the shadow is going to move and it's going to give us an east and west line. So we just have to wait an increment of 15 minutes and after an hour we're going to see what it looks like. So as you can see, after an hour, the tip of the stick has formed a linear pattern, right, moving this direction. So what we've discovered is our east and west line. So what we can do is put a stick here. We can move these. And this now 
is our east to west line. This is gonna be west, and this is gonna be east, okay? And perpendicular to that, we're gonna find our north and south line. So that means this is north. So why does this work? Well, remember, the sun tracks the sky from east to west. So if the sun is shining from the east, its shadow will be pointed to the west. And as the sun moves, the shadow will slowly advance towards the east. This is by far the best way to find north. The only drawbacks is that it takes time, and you can't do this on a cloudy day. I think the moral of the story is, if you're going to go out and explore, be prepared. I mean, if you're lost, knowing north isn't even going to help you if you don't know what direction you need to walk. That's why whenever I go backpack, I memorize a general map of the nearest towns and roads. If I'm backpacking in the eastern Sierra Nevadas, I know if I walk east, I'll eventually hit the 395 freeway. If I'm lost in Sequoia National Forest, I know if I continue to walk west, I'm eventually going to hit the Central Valley. I find that a lot of the fears we have of the outdoors all stem from the fear of the unknown. Sure, there are a lot of things that we need to be cautious about when we explore, but I believe the more you know about nature, the more confident you become, and the more empowered you are to go outside and put on your explorer boots. So, thanks for joining me. I'm the backpacking biologist, Dan. I'll catch you next time.